in the last two decades, the Kimze has had to endure floods normally only seen every hundred years, and on three separate occasions. The climate, animal world and landscape here have altered, and it seems as though the changes are always increasing. Two thousand hectares of the Kimsey area are flooded. In many places, the water levels continue to rise even after the rain, as the flood water runs down from everywhere into the deepest lying places. Animals living in the flooded areas develop refined survival strategies. These European fire ants surround their queen, and together create a kind of raft, even creating a new living space. When we humans take action against the increased flooding, it's often species like this that suffer. Someone who officially monitors animal diversity in such sensitive nature reserves is local ranger Dirk Alfermann. We really have seen an increase in major flooding like this in the last 10 to 15 years. It certainly happened two or three times in that period here at the Kimse. Of course, it's mostly the massive rainfall in the Alps, and then finally also snow melt, which is responsible. It's questionable how far it's also connected to a possible change of the climate. That definitely can't be answered for certain. Flooding is less of a catastrophe for nature it mostly affects humans. Access to the tourist area is blocked off. Instead of traffic flying across the Salzburg motorway, there is only muddy water, level with the municipality of Übersee. No boats setting off, no bathers, deadlock. Only the water rescue service boat is out and about, over the flooded meadows and pastures. Here and there, people and livestock are rescued from small islands. The farmers of the Alpine fringe are well used to the capricious weather. But one of them, Paul Arnold, thinks that something has changed. It's true that heavy rain, like we've had for the past few years, has become much more frequent. Also in spring and autumn, the change from winter to summer is a bit more extreme, perhaps. How it will continue, I don't think anyone can tell. No one can predict the future, but every cloud, as they say, has a silver lining. Flooding is basically a totally natural occurrence that happens again and again. When we take a look now out over the lake, we see a relative water level. Of course, not real flooding. It can be much more and even submerge the neighboring bedding meadows. But this can actually have a really positive effect on particular animal and plant species. Some rather unpopular animals also profit from this positive effect. No sooner are the meadows flooded than tiny boats start floating over the water. 300 mosquito eggs in a bundle, laid by a female who hibernated with them inside her. One week later, little hatches open up beneath. Minuscule mosquito larvae slither out, one after another. It's not only small animals that emerge around the flooded areas, however. This northern pike is on the lookout for his usual breeding ground. The largest predator in the Kimse is cautious and almost tender when it comes to wooing a female. 
Predatory fish a metre in length swim purposefully out of the lake and into the flooded meadows to spawn. There's no better nursery ground for the pike. The sun warms the water quickly, and there's more than enough around to eat. When the eggs have been released and fertilized, the pikes head back into the lake. Even though lake and meadow have, for the time being, merged into a single habitat. In shallow water, northern pikes are easy prey for large fish eaters. But bears have not been around the Kimse for a long time, and white-tailed eagles are as rare as they've always been. So this pike at least can get to deep water unharmed. Masses of warm, damp air from the north accumulate over the Alps. That's why there's more rain over the Alpine foothills than in the rest of Germany. The female pike has laid hundreds of thousands of eggs, which remain stuck to the grass and moss. After hatching, the pike larvae attach themselves to grass stalks using adhesive glands on their bellies and digest their supplies of egg yolk. Only one week later, thousands of mini pikes are out in the meadow on the hunt for anything that moves and which they can fit in their mouths. The flooded meadowlands are extremely productive. A lavish supply of food develops in the warm, shallow water. The mosquitoes here at the Kimse, or the different kinds of mosquito, of course, play a really important role as a biomass, a food source for different species of bird. But the larvae in the water are also food for amphibians or fish like the pike. Thanks to the abundance of food, the little pikes grow quickly. Mosquito larvae consist of 10% protein and have a high fat content. After only 14 days, the fish are as large as a finger. They have to take advantage of the ample food supply, because the water will soon subside and their little nursery dry up. Then, only those youngsters who find their way back to the lake well nourished will survive. Swamped meadows don't only harbor mosquito larvae and fish spawn, however, they also hide completely different treasures. In the Kingau, there are two examples of a crayfish threatened with extinction. The fairy shrimp lives exclusively in areas that fill up after heavy rainfall, then dry out again a few weeks later. Females have red-gold luminescent egg pouches, where eggs can mature before lying in dry conditions for years or even decades, until the hollow fills up with water again. Then the little shrimps wake up overnight to a new life, swimming always on their backs through their territory. All pool dwellers have to think of a plan when their habitat dries up. The shrimps leave eggs in the ground, the pikes swim back to the lake, and others simply fly away. No matter how many of them get eaten, there are always enough mosquito larvae left over 
to transform from struggling water-based larvae into fully-fledged land-based insects. The freshly hatched bloodsuckers have to sit for around an hour. Then they lift themselves up on their glassy wings and populate the environment. Now the swarms of mosquitoes get to meet the streams of visitors. Around 10 million guests come to the Kimgao every year, much to the delight of landlady Gabi Tsaizinger. Well, our guests come from here and from the neighboring places, but also from Munich. Lots of business people or holidaymakers, and also international people. Lots of Italians, French, and Swiss who've now also fallen in love with the Kimse. I don't really get the feeling that there are more mosquitoes than before. We went swimming every day as kids, and the mosquitoes were there in droves. I think there are actually fewer now, but people are reacting more sensitively to them. Lots of people come here from the city who are not used to it. After flooding, however, up to 50 billion mosquitoes hatch around the lake. While the males remain harmless, the females turn into a curse. Sucking blood is a true challenge for the little insects. After having drunk three times their own weight in warm blood, their body temperature increases suddenly by more than 10 degrees. In order to survive this, they produce special heat shock proteins. It's by no means only humans who are targeted. A young night heron is also tapped for blood. Nevertheless, in some years, the herons, as well as the people, are less irritated by the little pests when the authorities actually tackle them. In the five years I've been a restaurateur at the Hirschauer Bucht, of course, it's an area where you get mosquitoes. But with the use of BTI, we've never had any problems. At the moment, it's one week when you notice something, then they give it all a good hosing, and then it's actually fine. Areas of shallow water and flood zones around the lake are treated for mosquitoes by helicopter. Nature conservationists complain that the substance is also applied in nature protection areas in the form of lumps of ice, packed full with the protein produced by the Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, or BTI, a biological weapon in the service of the tourist industry. When the ice lumps melt, the BTI is released. The mosquito larvae ingest the substance involuntarily as they come into contact with everything that appears before their mandibles. The larvae filter food long enough for the bacterial protein to damage the digestive tract. Then they starve. the intestinal wall has dissolved. Studies have shown that the use of BTI has affected very few other insect species. With mosquitoes, however, it's up to 95%. The protein from the killer bug kills biting as well as harmless types of mosquito. which is bad news for mosquito lovers, like the common tree frog. The well-being of these rare frogs is dear to the hearts of environmentalists. Photographer Andreas Hartl doesn't enjoy being bitten, but he still appreciates the role of the mosquitoes in the ecosystem. 
Well, as a nature photographer, you're a fan of birds, a fan of fish, and you have to say that the mosquitoes just belong to the natural world. When I'm out and about taking photos, and then I see the helicopter above, chucking that insect poison into the conservation area, just throwing it down by the banks of the Kimse, and you know that the food resource of the animals is being destroyed, the animals being the reason I'm here, then I do start to boil inside. Mosquitoes and their larvae, as well as many other insect species, play a vital role in the ecosystem of the marsh and reed areas. Also, for animals who don't eat them themselves. Many animals that are prey for others, like the little bittern, feed on insects. In the bittern's nest, the first chicks have hatched. The father helps the youngster out of the thin shell which he'll eject from the nest once he's finished. Little bitterns still count as extremely rare, but have greatly increased recently. The number of breeding birds has risen fivefold over the past two decades in Germany. Nevertheless, the birds often build their nests in inaccessible reedy undergrowth, and neither young nor old bitterns make much noise. So they're very hard to discover, and perhaps have just been simply overlooked in many spots. Something is approaching the reeds. The female is coming. A staff changeover. Like so much in the lives of this miniature heron, very easy going. Once the male has crept off silently, the female brings up some small fish and anything else she's caught on the banks and in the reeds for her offspring. While this is happening, like always, some nearby changes are taking their unstoppable course. I've been around the Kimgau regularly for three, four decades already, as it's simply a perfect place for a nature photographer. And you just notice it when you've been coming for so long that there have been some negative changes as well. That's not only at home, outside my door, not why I come to Kimse, because it's more beautiful. But also here at the Kimse, flower meadows are disappearing. The globe flower meadows are largely gone. The Siberian iris meadows, the blue eyes of the Kimgau are fewer and fewer. And if we're not careful, then everything will be lost that attracts people, including myself, to the Kimse. The colourful flower meadows exist as part of extensive grassland that provides once or twice a year a harvest of hay or barn bedding. On the wet meadows of the flooded areas, Often centuries-old botanical beauties, such as the bird's eye primrose, are growing. Yet most of the meadows like this in the Kimgau are now drained and mucked, in order to improve the quality of the livestock feed and make the area more profitable. Since me and my wife took over the farm from my parents, we've been managing around 20 hectares. There are simply fewer flower meadows. But it's completely logical if you know the background. Farmers are reliant on being able to bring a protein-rich, nutritious food source into the barns or the silos. And we only have a harvesting window of a few days, because the older the grass becomes, so that flowers are blossoming, the fewer nutrients there are. So the grass is cut very young, and that's why you don't see so many flowers. Also, 
In general, it's maybe a bit of a pity, because the species' diversity suffers. Particular butterflies are also not there anymore, as they need particular grasses in full bloom. But society wants cheap food, and then you have to accept this kind of thing. And it's not possible to pay the same price for milk that you did 50 years ago, when everyone's had a wage increase over those 50 years. Then the farmer has to ensure that he can bring in an extra yield in order to try to gather at least a bit of what otherwise goes down the drain. Some meadows like this still exist in the Chiemgau, mostly thanks to nature conservation grants and the work of rural maintenance volunteers. A kind of outdoor botanical museum. The kind of landscape changes you see happening everywhere are also noticeable at the Chiemsee, of course. The first cornfields are already eating away toward the lake banks. But it's a decision people have to make here, in terms of what they deem to be important. A few more cornfields and less nature, or else an environment of which people can still say in the future, Chiemgau, Chiemsee, that's my destination, that's where I want to go. Like me. On the other hand, who would willingly slide into the red in order to maintain a landscape that is no longer up to date, even if it's still so beautiful? It's clear everywhere, not only in the Chiemgau, that particular wild animal species are rapidly on the decline, including those that were previously common, like the Eurasian curlew. Or the swallows, normally inseparable from the meadows, fields and cow stalls. Chimney swallows are for many people harbingers of good luck. Sadly, the opposite is not the case. Chimney swallows and house martins have been at the early warning stage of the red species list since 2004. Simply unimaginable in the past. Ornithologists regard the gradually declining insect life as the main reason. The birds are simply not finding enough food so easily. Flies and mosquitoes are the main source of nourishment for the chimney swallows. They can't simply switch to another food type. All these species are under severe threat because their habitat is changing bit by bit. When liquid manure is spread only once, and the field mown more than twice a year, flowers, insects and meadow birds disappear within a summer. At one time, hundreds, even thousands of Eurasian Kulu couples bred in the Kimgao region. The warbling of the courting birds was as much a part of the landscape as the church bells. Only four or five couples remain today. And they breed in specially designated protection zones rather than the farmer's fields like before. Nonetheless, more and more of these protection zones are being created in the Chiemgau. When you go around the lake, you notice lots more places where nature is being given something back, like at Kendal Mühlfilzen, where the exploited fenlands have been watered again, so that a beautiful marsh can exist once more. From the air, one can still see the contours of the old peat extraction areas. The closer one gets, however, the more the landscape resembles undisturbed nature and the marshland is actually easier to reconstitute than most other habitats. As soon as the water builds up, a diverse animal world returns. 
We've got lots of marshland and also hill bogs here in the Kimgao, of course. Many centuries ago, these would certainly have been several thousand hectares. But with drainage and extensive peat harvesting, this was decimated. In the last 10, 20 years, however, these areas have been naturalized again through intentional waterlogging. When reed and cane begins to proliferate in rewatered zones like this, the marsh harrier can find what it needs to raise its offspring. This male has brought back a mouse. The harriers also eat lizards, frogs and songbirds, however, prey that is only available if there's enough insect life around. Marsh harriers construct their nests in amongst the reeds, on the ground. If flooding happens here at the wrong time, the eggs will be lost. If everything is fine, though, the harrier parents take turns looking after the offspring. The female comes to take over the parental care duties, and the couple take the chance to stage a short courtship display. The reeds form a kind of jungle, where many animals can hide from enemies and inquisitive glances. Beyond the edge of the reeds, however, in the lake itself, the tangle of aquatic plants also offers shelter to creatures that we rarely set eyes upon, and many who perhaps like it that way. A water spider, the only spider in the world that lives underwater, and builds a kind of air bubble. When the spider catches some prey, it spins a little balloon out of silk from its spinning glands, filling it up using its silvery air pocket. Finally, the spider turns around and sticks its head, together with the prey, into the air balloon, enabling it to eat in more or less dry conditions. Even the baby spiders walk along through the water with a small air supply. Mosquito larvae are the main food source of the water spiders. Wherever the mosquitoes are being combated, things are tough for the spiders. The little bittern offspring have developed well. They signal to their father that they're hungry with unmistakable begging sounds. However, their fate depends not only on their parents' ability to find enough food. The little bittern is, of course, something very special. And the chicks look really funny. They have real mohawk hair. They also hatch one after the other, so six days apart. And although there's quite a size difference, they're all fed equally. The little ones are not left without, because they're too late or pushed aside by the bigger ones. So all six of them get on well. And it really is a joy to see when they make it and leave the nest, clambering around the reeds and then going out to sleep in the pastures. And you wish that they will survive the journey to Africa and come back the next year in one piece. Whether more, fewer or no bitterns at all will be breeding in the Kimgo in the future depends not only on us humans. We can, of course, protect reed areas and even lay down new ones. We can let them grow and thus ensure that the young bitterns have a good supply of food. But ultimately, these birds spend a large portion of the year in faraway lands, where we can't influence what might befall them. These imponderables turn nature conservation 
into an adventure. No one can say in advance exactly which animals and plants will settle in a newly formed biotope. That's why it'll always be exciting. No single reed area resembles another. No year is like the previous one. The changes which bring with them alterations to the landscape are hard to predict. At the edge of the reed bed, the storks are in the water the whole year round. Here, the kingdom of the birds meets that of the fish. The pike from the flooded zones are now as long as a hand and pose a threat to any slightly smaller lake dwellers, even if they're related. Eat and be eaten. That also applies in the floating leaf zone of the lake. Lots of young fish conceal themselves beneath the leaves of the yellow pond lily and white water lily. At least there's more protection from aerial bombardment here than in the open water. Different species of fish exist side by side. An aquatic melting pot which seeks protection in a single shoal. The Kimze has numerous shallow bays with silt floors. Many types of water and floating plants grow here which are populated by countless lake inhabitants. Offspring have arrived for the great crested grebes. Their parents feed them with small feathers. The feathers mix with the bones of the fish that the little ones will feed on later. This allows them to form pellets more easily, which help them get rid of indigestible particles of food. Fish hunters find their way easily around the labyrinth of floating plants. The grebes stage thrilling chases with their prey. After all, fishing in the tangle of yellow pond lilies isn't all that easy. This young bird is already a month old. He'll only be independent in six weeks' time. Until then, his parents provide him with freshly caught fish, such as this pike, a pretty large morsel. Some parts of the Kimze are seemingly untouched by the changes. Nature appears to be virtually unscathed here. From the water, one can see especially well that large stretches of the more than 80 kilometer long shoreline are unspoiled and lined with wild woods and reeds. The Herreninsel has also remained pristine and natural although it's the primary tourist magnet, attracting half a million people every year. King Ludwig II's palace is, of course, the biggest draw. But the island is also fascinating for nature fans. The fairy tale king purchased the building site in 1873 from Württemberg wood speculators who wanted to deforest the Herren Kimse. But because the shy monarch valued solitude, he immediately acquired the entire island. By doing so, he saved the ancient forests that surround the palace to the present day. These forests, which contain especially massive beech trees, harbor a diverse flora and fauna. Fifteen species of bat alone live on the Heron Kimse, also because they can still find enough insects to eat their fill. Not only rare animals live here, however. If they're not persecuted and can feel secure, common buzzards even breed near humans. The old trees and thick forests of the island 
offer the birds everything they need to feel safe. Old trees are important for many life forms. Some stay up in the light flooded treetops, while others prefer to settle in further down, at the foot of the beaches, where it's damp and dusky. The lumpy bracket, for example, a tree fungus that provides a stage for a curious phenomenon. In warm and dry conditions, the fungus releases its spores in order to procreate. They float through the woods in delicate wisps of cloud, falling randomly down to the forest floor. A particular animal has become a specialist in trapping these clouds of spores. The larvae of the highly secretive fungus gnat crawl around the underside of the fungus, trying to scavenge as many of the pores as possible. So that the gathering of the minuscule food particles is not too strenuous, the little maggot has a trick up its sleeve that it only pulls out in darkness. They and their related species only become really active when night falls over the woods of the Helen Kingsay. Now, the worm-like creatures weave spore-catching nets under the fungal bodies using the finest silk. And they light up while they're doing it. Exactly why the larvae light up at night is unknown. In fact, not much is known about them at all. A stop-motion camera and long exposure times make visible the movements and the blue glimmer of the tiny, roughly two centimetre long animal. The next day, they eat the little nets together with the trapped spores. There are even more apparently ghostly occurrences that happen in the Kimgao at night. In the swamps around the lake, some undead beings are coming back to life. Some time-lapse footage from our filming reveals the event. Dead trees, small but often many decades old, suddenly begin to move, despite not a drop of sap remaining in them. Variations in temperature and humidity are probably responsible for the movements. The dead branches move depending on water content, a phenomenon thus far unresearched, a reminder of the countless number of surprises nature has in store for us, and the fact that we are very far from knowing and understanding it all. Who can tell which irreversible consequences exploitation of the Kimze marshes might have? And who knows what secrets may still lurk in the reed forests? That alone should be reason enough for us to protect the reed zones by the edges of the lake. The little bittern chicks have developed well. A bit of fluff on their heads reminds us that, until recently, they were nestlings. Now they can hunt insects, frogs and small fish for themselves. With success, a European bitterling makes a tasty bittern breakfast. Next year, we'll probably also see offspring for the Kimgao bitterns. Probably. It'll depend on whether the changes in the landscape happen gradually enough for the quirky birds to adapt. And whether that happens depends in turn on us humans. 
every one of us can have a say in how the land in the Qingao is farmed. We can influence things by spending our money on the produce of sustainable cultivation. For example, an intact reed belt depends also on healthy surroundings, in which chemicals and machinery are used with restraint. Then the Qingao will remain beautiful for a long time to come. Whether things will stay like this in the future, it's hard to say. One would hope so. But it depends on the behavior of consumers changing. Then it will be easier to say for sure that things could be kept the way they are. But if it keeps going the way it does now, that everyone is only interested in a low price and people want things cheap, cheap, cheap all the time, then we have to accept that there will be another price to pay. And so nature will also suffer in particular ways, because something has to give. But the changes aren't all bad. There's also some good news. Here at the Kimse, we have a very diverse wildlife that doesn't stay the same all year round, but rather fluctuates dramatically, even just regarding the bird life. There are certainly species that have returned in the past 10 or 20 years, like for instance the black kites, who have become regular breeders here. The white-tailed eagle has also been attempting to breed here for a good 10 years. It seems as if disruptions led to them migrating out. They're still spotted, however, and the hope remains that they might establish themselves here again. The white-tailed eagle is a symbol of nature conservation. Its numbers have picked up throughout Germany. Indeed, nothing stands in the way of a lasting settlement of the birds at the Chiemsee. However, the sudden appearance of such rare birds cannot conceal the fact that many other species are in decline. Turbulent times for the wildlife of the Chiemsee, and not only in this weather. Storm warnings occur up to 100 times a year at the Kimse. Then gales of up to 100 kilometers an hour rip across the water. Only very few people are relaxing beside or even on the lake right now. For the environment, it doesn't actually matter whether there's more or less stormy weather and flooding in the future. The important thing is how humans interact with the Keen Gao landscape. It gets really black out there and starts raining, so much that we're wiped out. But nevertheless, if I imagine coming back to the Kimse in a hundred years' time, then of course, I would hope to also be able to see globe flower meadows again, that the irises, the blue ones, would be in full bloom, and that especially in spring, the curlews would still be warbling, as they just belong to the Kimse in spring. If that was all possible, then I'd like to come back to the Kimse in a hundred years, the most beautiful place on Earth, even if I know it's only a dream, of course. Much has changed in the Kingo. The Eurasian curlews hardly breed here anymore. That's where they spend winter here. What will people say in a hundred years from now, when they look back and ask themselves what these changes provided and at what price?